How's it going, folks? Welcome back to another rendition and addition and subtrition of Birds by Beegis. And today, we're not going to be just talking about birds. Now, I know this may come as a shock to you, but believe it or not, I do have a wide variety of interests, including salmon. Salmon, obviously, as you know, are delicious, but they're more than that, folks. They have a really important role in Pacific Northwest ecosystems. These fish make their way out from the open ocean into Ialic Bay, into the mouth of our lower lagoon, and then start making their way as that tide rises, and they swim and swim and swim, and make their way all the way up into Addison Lake. What we're looking at here is Addison Creek, and this water is exiting obviously from Addison Lake. And don't worry, we're gonna get there soon. But for now, we wanna understand and examine this interplay. So on the low tide and the high tide, the water level fluctuates in here. As you can see, a lot of this bladder rack is currently exposed, indicating that we're at a kind of a lowish tide. And so as this tide increases, so too do the salmon during the right time of the year. So salmon generally run between early August and late August. So it's really interesting to me to think about how this fish that spends most of its time out in the ocean in salt water comes back to this freshwater system and is still able to live and persist despite this drastic change in water chemistry. So when they're out at sea, basically salmon are constantly taking in water and excreting sodium and chloride to make sure that their sodium and chloride levels are optimal. This is what we call osmoregulation. So a different set of pressures affect the salmon as they return to a freshwater system where sodium and chloride levels are much lower. They're actually pumping in sodium and chloride into their body because they're trying to maintain an optimal ratio between the sodium and the chloride. So for now, we're gonna make our way up towards Addison Lake and keep trudging along Addison Creek. And our intention here is to really examine the importance of salmon and the marine derived nitrogen and what an incredible role it plays in the ecosystem and the food web around here, namely bears, eagles, river otters, sea otters, harbor seals, as well as the trees and vegetation that make up this area. So come on. We have three types of salmon that inhabit this waterway. We have chum, sockeye, and humpies. I think it's really remarkable how massive a journey they undertake, you know, avoiding predators that love to feast on the salmon. And they make their way all the way up through these waterways and return to their ancestral grounds where they will breed and eventually meet their inevitable doom and decay. But it's not so horrible, folks. There are some incredible benefits of the salmon coming up here. As the salmon make their way up, the bears usually are the primary predators on salmon, and eagles as well. But bears oftentimes will fish them out of the water, eat their head, eat the roe, and then leave the spawned out carcass on the side for other animals to pick apart. Now this is just incredible because this marine derived nitrogen, nitrogen coming from the ocean, basically brought up here like a conveyor belt by the salmon, is fertilizing so much around here. And so as it fertilizes the riverbanks and the sides of the streams, those plants are growing at a tremendous rate. And as those plants grow up to three times as fast with these intact salmon runs, the, the plants are actually having a positive impact on the salmon because as they grow and shade the sides of the riverbank, it cools the water and shades the area in which the salmon are spawning and laying their eggs in the creek bed. about to go track down some sockeye salmon that swam up this very dinky little creek and we're going to check out what they're up to now. Come on. Okay, so up ahead is the koi pond and it looks like there's a couple first year glaucous wing gulls hanging out in here. Now, 
what happens for the salmon in terms of spawning is the female and the male both participate in what's called a red. And a red is basically a depression in the gravel that they swipe across with their tail, creating a little dugout or furrow. And so as that furrow is created, the female will come by and lay her eggs in there. And basically the males are jockeying for position because it's still up to the female to choose which male she's going to mate with. And so all of these fish are hanging out in this koi pond right now. And so while this process is happening, there's a variety of other animals that like to take advantage of this bounty of energy that's being created, namely the salmon roe or the eggs. So you can see these glaucous wing gulls, they're hanging out waiting for the female salmon to spawn and let go of her eggs. And sometimes they'll hop in the water and start almost like dabbling down trying to get the salmon roe and eat them. Now these salmon never meet their offspring, but their offspring instinctually know when it's time to return back down through Addison Creek, back out towards the intertidal area where they hang out for about a year or so in the shallows and then make their way out to sea. Some species of salmon spend about two years out at sea and return. Some spend up to six years out at sea and return here. Today has been another installment in our nature series exploring salmon, the Pacific Northwest forest, and the ecosystems in which they inhabit. I'm going to go get some dinner and I'll see you next time. Now I wanted to share a tiny bit more, so stay with us, about salmon, fisheries, and sustainability. In the past I used to get salmon from wherever because I didn't really know frankly, but now as I'm an informed consumer and an educated young man, I understand that it's important to support fisheries that are promoting sustainability and conservation measures. Here in Alaska we have really stringent requirements for Alaskan wild caught salmon. And this is important because fisheries biologists are actually able to adequately manage and predict what fisheries are able to withstand in terms of con consumption and fishing rates. Unlike the Atlantic salmon farming that's going on in the Pacific Northwest, Pacific wild caught salmon are a really incredible and sustainable option for salmon purchasing. And I'm not going to get too heavy on it, but I just wanted to share and implore you guys to do your research and feel free to check out the difference between Atlantic caught salmon and Pacific caught salmon and how they're impacting the native environment in which they're raised in.